Good afternoon. Um, welcome to our session about getting started with open education. Thank you for being here. I'm Jennifer England. I use she and her pronouns, and I'm really excited to spend um, the next 45 minutes or so together talking about open education. And this is a topic that um, is really near and dear to my heart at the University of Minnesota. I work, study, and sometimes teach, and I bring open education into each of these roles or identities. So as a staff member in ATSS, um, I'm an instructional designer with Academic Technology Support Services. I have worked with faculty on open education projects, and I have served as the chair of a special interest group focused on OER, open educational resources. As a PhD candidate, I'm studying how people who do work like me, so my fellow instructional designers, how we are involved in open ed projects around campuses and what that looks like. And when I do teach, I try to bring in open pedagogy as much as possible and introduce students to open licenses. So I probably said a bunch of words that you are maybe really have no idea what I'm talking about, but don't worry. Um, we'll go into I'll go into more of that um, as as we progress here. Um, but that is a little bit about me, and I would love to hear more about who is here um, in the chat. If you would like to share a little bit about what course you're teaching for the fall what brought you here today, and what you hope to learn or share. Excellent. Thank you so much, everyone, for sharing a little bit about your courses. And please continue to use the chat to it and share a little bit more. Walk history class, how fun. Our agenda for today, we're going to talk about what is open education? What does that mean? We'll talk a little bit about open educational resources, what they are, and how to, I'm going to move my move some of the Zoom windows out of the way, um, how to find open educational resources. And then we'll also talk about open pedagogy, what that means and what it looks like. And please make liberal use of the chat kind of think of it as a back channel, pose questions to myself, to others. Um, chances are, well, there's, of course, we all have a, a lot of knowledge and experiences that we bring. And what I may not know, maybe someone else will know. So we can kind of think of it as all kind of helping one another also, or just kind of think aloud what's on your mind. Um, you'll see me alternating between looking at directly at the camera and over to my monitor on the right, I have the chat open. So I'm hoping I can um, acknowledge your questions right away and, and address them um, either immediately or you know, when, it, when it makes sense or whatnot. So I would love to see your faces too, if you are able to, but no pressure either way. So our goals for today, um, this is intended to be a high level of open education, of open educational resources, and open pedagogy. So really to provide some introductions to these topics. I'm also hoping that we can think about some small steps. And if you are interested in exploring them in more detail and taking some small steps, then hopefully um, you'll also leave with a good understanding of what resources are available to you for taking those small steps. Okay, so let's go ahead and just start digging into the first topic and thinking about what is open education? What does this mean? And this is a phrase that can encompass a number of different activities in education. And depending on who you speak with, it can mean different things to different people. One definition that I find to be very useful and concise comes from the University of British Columbia, who's a leader in this area. And they define open education as a collection of practices that use online technology to freely share knowledge. 
And even that is a, is a, is a pretty big and a pretty broad ranging definition. And under the umbrella of open education, there are a number of specific ways in which this sharing of knowledge takes place in higher education. And the practices can include publishing research in open journals, so open access publishing. Another practice could be releasing data to be reused by others. That's known as open data. The practice of using, sharing, and collaboratively creating software and computer code might be a more familiar or recognized practice. Free and open source software might um, ring some bells or be familiar, um, especially to folks who are teaching um, some cloud security or data management courses. Flexible admission policies to institutions or courses. Uh, these open admissions or open registration policies are hallmarks of open universities, which seek to lower the barriers to entry of post-secondary education. Another practice could be the sharing of teaching and research practices, such as open scholarship. And then the last two practices that we're going to focus on in more detail today are the sharing and reuse of teaching and learning materials, including courses and textbooks, also known as open educational resources, and student assignments that promote publishing or participation engagement on the open web. And these are commonly grouped together as open teaching or open pedagogy. And this isn't an exhaustive list by any means of all the practices that open education might take the shape of, but hopefully it'll start to give you an idea of the types of activities that the phrase open education encompasses. So with that overview, um, I'd like to move into our first of three breakout rooms. And um, I've put together a breakout room discussion guide, and I'm going to go ahead and um, move from my slides to the breakout room discussion guide. And hopefully you are seeing that now. And I will put um, this link in the chat as well. I'll make sure I get this to everyone. And so um, we'll go into breakout rooms at, at three separate times. We'll keep the breakout room composition the same. So the folks that you'll be talking with in a couple of minutes here, you'll be joining them um, two more times as well. And we'll use the same document here as well. And I have the document set up so you can jump directly into a particular breakout room. And I know sometimes navigating and trying to figure out which breakout room you are in is a challenge in and of itself. But when you are in it, just look for the, in the upper left-hand corner and then you'll see where that, where that room is. So our prompts, and there are, there are quite a few, but just kind of pick and choose what makes sense to you. So in your group, you might think, um, about talking about what does open education mean to you, where some of the activities that I talked about, such as open scholarship, um, open data, are any of those part of your regular education practice? And what, what does that mean? What does that look like? And then there are a couple other um, prompts too. So um, don't feel pressured to try and try and discuss all of that. Um, again, that's just there as kind of a starting point and to get us going for some discussion. And we'll have about five minutes or so to talk. And when we come back together, um, each of the groups will be invited to share a key takeaway from the discussion, either verbally or you can share it in chat as well. Yes. Hello, everyone. Welcome back. How, would, would anyone be interested in sharing a little bit about your discussion? Sure, I, I can go. Uh, we we talked. Uh, let's see. To summarize, uh, 
we, we've had some exposure of what uh, uh, open education might look like. Um, not limited use within our classrooms right now. Um, because I teach a cloud-based class, um, I can pull down sources. Uh, uh, John pointed out that you know he can pull down code, and then we sort of drifted to other online resources. Mm -hmm. but all right. in a summary, I, I don't think we're really using what would have qualified as uh, open education. Thank you. But we would like to hear more. <laughs> and there's there's no, well, I'll just say it. Some people might get into the fact that there is a right or a wrong way to do open education. I think, you know, we're all starting at different places mm -hmm. and it, it's okay to take small steps. So mm -hmm. that is that is perfectly fine. So Susan, it sounded like you might, were you interested in sharing a little bit? Well, I had just said in my uh, in our discussion, I do a healthcare law and ethics course, and so I'm really trying to get the students familiar with where to go for information. Certainly, not necessarily an open university format per se, mm -hmm. but many times federal government publications, state, you know, uh, professional organizations with their ethical guidelines. But um, I think the open university concept that I'm most familiar with is Coursera. I don't know if that's an example. That's immediately what came to my mind. Um, but also to the notion of, um, you know, open source materials. I've, I've been on an editorial board for a journal that publishes, but also says, take it, use it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And those, those concepts are certainly welcoming. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Thank you. And I, I saw um, Tyler had a question about a prominent, what is a prominent open university? And one example is the Open University in the United Kingdom, and that was founded in 1962, 72, huh. maybe, even, maybe even longer. But in the US, we um, have some similar equivalents. And so uh -huh. um, you could also think of like some community colleges, for example, with the really flexible admission policies, not requiring you know, certain scores on standardized tests or perhaps mm -hmm. not even any standardized tests at all. And so right. those are some of the barriers to entry that some of the open universities I see. really seek to encourage. Gotcha. So, yeah. yeah. I, I have one other example that I, that I didn't sure. bring up in discussion, but um, uh, three times now as a result of the class that I'm in, I've had students say, I'd really like to get that, you know, AWS certification. Uh, can, can you set up an independent study and help me toward that goal? And in those cases, I find what I'm doing is pulling together places and things that they can go because I'm, I'm acting as the, the mentor you know, tracker, mm -hmm. you know, right. guiding them. And, and that, so that's a case where I'd say, yeah, that, that feels like open education because we agree on the packet. Mm -hmm. I'm not directly instructing it, um, but, but I'm helping them get through and evaluating. Yeah, are you, are you moving along toward your goal? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Thank you. And that is a great example that I will probably come back to a little bit later when we, um, talk about open pedagogy. So thank you for bringing that up. So we're going to narrow the focus at this point from this big, huge topic, that big umbrella idea of open education and move into one of the, one of the practices, um, open educational resources, commonly referred to as OER. And there are a number of different definitions for open educational resources, but they all contain similar elements. UNESCO first defined the term in 2002, so that is the version that I use, and it defines OER as teaching, learning, and research materials in any medium, digital or otherwise, that reside in the public domain or have been released under an open license that permits no cost access use, adaptation, and redistribution by others with no or limited resources. So there's a lot going on in this definition and I want to pull out two pieces and focus on them. And the first piece 
are the teaching, learning, and research materials. And this can, this can take a lot of different forms. And so commonly we might go immediately to textbooks, right? And so that is certainly one op option using an open textbook. Another option might be videos. One of the faculty members in the math department, the School of Mathematics has created numerous videos that explain concepts in algebra. That's one of the open education projects um, I was able to work on in the past. And he created the first set of videos for algebra. He's created a second set of videos for pre-calculus. He's now in the process and has maybe even completed this work of creating a third set of videos for calculus. And his next plans were to group all of them together in a video textbook, and then also include some practice problem sets. So thinking about courses and activities and assessments, such as these practice problem sets, that's another example of what OER could be. For an undergraduate course that I taught a couple of years ago, I created a series of digital skill building assignments, just very short assignments that were focused on a specific task. And I openly licensed those and shared them in a repository. I'll talk a little bit more about what that means in a little bit. And there could be many, many other options, such as reading lists, simulations, um, really almost any part of your course could be considered an OER, including the syllabus. And the second part of the definition, the OER definition that I would like to pull out is the open license. You are probably familiar with the icon on the left, the, the letter C with the circle around it. And the icon on the right with the two lowercase letter C's and the circle around it, that might be less familiar. And when we talk about an open license, it means moving from copyright, the all rights reserved, to a set of conditions under which works can be used and distributed. So thinking about some rights reserved. And the set of conditions are outlined in open licenses. Creative Commons is the nonprofit organization that stewards open licenses, and you may hear CC licenses as a shorthand for it. There are six different open license types, and they range from the most permissive or accommodating, um, such as shown in the upper left-hand corner, and that is the CC by license. If you find material with a CC by license, for example, I, I licensed uh, the slides that I'm using today under a CC by license, that means you could change part of the material, you could share it with, with anyone else, with students, other educators, or you could sell it. However, you need to credit the person that created it. And that's where that, uh, that BY, the attribution, and you'll see the, the BY parts on each of these six licenses. So providing attribution, providing credit is an important part of every single of the six open license types. The least permissive is the image in the lower right-hand corner. That's the CC BY NC and D license. And this functions a lot like copyright with the all rights reserved. So material, if you see any materials with the CC by NC and D license, um, it can be shared. For example, um, you can download a PDF from a website, for example. But that PDF can't be changed in any way. Uh, it can't be sold. And again, you know, if you do share it with someone else, you need to provide that, that credit for the person who originally created it. And the details around each of the license types get very detailed very quickly and they're topics worthy of their own webinar. There's many actual courses, all kinds of certifications available for it too, um, if you're interested in digging into it more. And so due to those, due to time constraints, we're not going to delve too deeply into those details today, um, but, um, again, 
in keeping with the goals and thinking about providing a high level overview, I wanted to just provide an introduction for awareness. Um, I see a question. If you allow someone to change the material and sell it, is there a danger that the material presents you in a negative light if things are changed as they should be? I mean, that, that, that is a concern. I would say it's also a concern if with almost anything that is released. For example, um, there have been some researchers who've had, you know, their, their work, their ideas, whatnot, taken in a completely different way. Um, Ivan Illich comes to mind and his idea of providing vouchers or whatnot has been taken in all kinds of interesting directions. And so I think the licenses themselves aren't really, um, don't really, aren't kind of the, ma the main piece um, in terms of maybe misrepresenting or misunderstanding the materials. So, but that is a, a that's a great question. I mean, it is a topic that get that is very much gets talked about too, and we start thinking about open licenses. So, um, the ne the next piece when we start talking about OER is it sounds like there's a lot of material out there, right? How does somebody find that? And a good way to do that is to search through a repository and there are a number that exist. And um, yes, the various open licenses are legally binding, John. So the one of the repositories is called Merlot. Um, they have a very strong Merlot theme for everything that they do, which is which can be kind of fun at times. Um, so this is one of the earlier repositories that started in 1997. And in addition to kind of the basic browse by discipline, add a material options, it also has a very robust community and you can participate in a grape camp. So again, carrying through with the Merlot theme and participating in a grape camp means that you can be a peer reviewer for materials in your discipline. OpenStax is another repository also with a longish history starting in 1999. One of the nice features about OpenStax is it seeks to make resources other than textbooks immediately visible. So on the homepage here, for example, you can start exploring textbooks right away if that's what you're looking for. You can also look through instructor guides. So maybe you're looking for test banks or presentation materials, or you can look through the materials for students such as study guides. Another repository is the OAR Commons. And one of the distinguishing features about this repository is that it aligns with K-12 standards with a disclaimer that not all of the standards for every single state are listed in it. So good side, downside also. But one of the features of this site, kind of similar to Merlot, which had some community features um, this site also builds in the ability to have hubs and groups, and you may be able to see it right up here. It might be really small font. And so the hubs and the groups are pretty nice spaces where projects or institutions, states, initiatives can come together and share resources in a common place. So not only the members of the project or an initiative could find it, but then it can also be publicly available for others to use and reuse as well. The Open Textbook Library, which is headquartered at the University of Minnesota, is another option for searching for OER. And one of the distinguishing features of this repository um, is that it is strictly for textbooks and its audience is very strongly focused on higher education as well. This repository, and I, there's a small maroon rectangle at the bottom here that um, is highlighting the reviews. And this is one of the distinguishing features of the Open Textbook Library repository and that it prominently features reviews from instructors who have evaluated the book for their course, 
um, or and or have used the book in their course as well. And this is an important feature incorporating the reviews. Open Textbook Library is not the only repository that does this, um, but to have it very prominently featured is important because the quality of OER has been an ongoing conversation for many years and there's quite a lot of literature around it as well. Uh, let's see, I'm just seeing that question here from John. If the materials are used by students in research on a topic, are they cited in the same manner as, as published works? Um, yes, if students are simply using any kind of OER, then they would um, cite what they're using in the same manner if, if they were using um, an academic journal or a book chapter or something. So. And the last repository um, that I would like to share is from BC campus. And one of the, or two of the distinguishing features of this repository are a strong focus on accessibility, particularly texts that are, that are authored through BC campus. And in recent years, they have been focusing on inclusion of content for the trades. So those are two of the, really nice features about this repository. And it's, it's not pictured here in the image, it's cut off, but um, in this navigation on the left-hand side at the very bottom, there's an option to search for trades. Um, there is an option, so we could have a, just a broad conversation about um, what does it mean to select course content? What are some considerations? Um, or if folks wanna do kind of a hands-on exploration in one of the repositories, we could do that too. So we've got some options. I'm, I am really curious about um, what does course content selection look like, um, particularly in CCAPS is do instructors have, um, is, it, is it full discretion? Is there some kind of some conversations about you know, having a pool of resources or what, what does that look like? Well, I think I'll start uh, just as an example, the, uh, uh, the content that I pulled, obviously I use two textbooks, but I also use a tremendous amount of information that's online uh, because in healthcare, it's, the standards and rules are changing constantly. Um, uh, so, but I, I really um, update the course every semester. I don't really run it through a panel of reviewers or um, get any approvals necessarily. Um, I don't know about the others of you. Yeah, I can represent uh, sort of the, a different uh, view of that spectrum. Uh, last year in the summer, it was time for my course to be uh, redesigned. I think that's every three years. Mm. And so I taught it the previous, mine, mine like yours, Susan, I update it every semester, mm -hmm. uh, but every three years, the scaffolding around that changes by a course designer. In my case, I imagine it's common too. The instructor can be the course designer for the following semester. But then within that, I haven't uh, I haven't seen any uh, prohibitions or guidance around how much I want to change the class when I'm actually teaching it. Sure. Right. It's pretty wide latitude in INET. I'm with Norm, and we, um, you know, we have a a basic standard for the department. We have the uh, program objectives mm -hmm. and the, I, I think that are the, they're the most, what you wanna call rigid. Then we step down to kind of the learning objectives, right? <clears throat> and those marry up to it as we're all working, at, we're working on accreditation in our department as well. And, and mm -hmm. then there are the uh, individual, discrete learning objectives in the course right. to meet the course objectives to meet the program objectives and so keeping that sort of hierarchy set and going is is uh pretty well established and agreed upon where the instructors have latitude in what we from our perspective is course design is the content design and the exercises around the content in order to achieve the learning objectives pretty much free will mm -hmm. 
And so that's kind of how our department operates, you know. So I'm fascinated to look at these resources actually. Yeah, me have too. A, have a course I started in 04 and I don't have a text. I wrote it from the ground up word one. Yeah. And so it'd be interesting to um, mm -hmm. uh, look at, at, especially the last one you showed uh, with the actual textbooks and let's see what they have in computer science and um, right. specifically networking and take a look at it. Hmm. And I'm not sure, John, it sounds like you have an amazing wealth of resources then uh, with your course. And um, you probably have a, a great system having used it for so long. Um, but there are, and if you are interested in kind of delving into publishing, you know, kind of sharing it more broadly, whatnot, um, there are some resources available in the libraries for that. And I, I do have some links on the slide. So, um, or I'm happy to talk more about it with you as well. So. Very cool. Um, yeah, I know we have about a minute left. So um, yeah, I will say that there are um, on the last two uh, slides that I had shared, um, there are a lot of links to other resources. So, um, sure. and I tried to keep them, you know, pretty straightforward, not getting too down into the weeds. Sure. Um, not everyone wants to write their dissertation on this topic, so <laughs> we tried to keep it um, right, yeah, not, one, too, not too detailed. <laughs> but one challenge, I think, and this is a common thread, uh, uh, Susan, John, and I, is um, uh, keeping the material up to date with the topic right. because yes. it is changing rapidly. Yeah, and, and so those, those resources could be you know, really useful depending on the date and the currency of them. Exactly. That's a challenge I always face. Um, mm -hmm. You know, I, I you know, I, I once taught cloud security and said, well, this is circa 2012. <laughs> and oh, this is about 2016. Here's what, you know, right. we're looking at today. Yeah, that's a, that's a huge jump, even four years. So for, for a topic like cloud computing, cloud security, so absolutely. Something I encountered, I'll just be real brief, last semester is um, students took my course materials that they had prepared, you know, and they had written case studies and written papers, and they sold them to this group called Course Hero. Oh, yes. Um, oh, and there yeah. are many, many of them now where yeah. your work is, uh, you find yourself on, online, and also the students have, you know, sold it um, and made money. So it's just another whole another scholastic issue um, um, but anyway it's a little different scenario but in another way it is kind of the new open <laughs> Un yeah unfortunately course. i'm sorry to hear that that that, that happened um, oh it's random. Yeah, so. it's not just happening with me but um, yes. the students had in just in the course of one assignment five students turned in a duplicate paper published in this course hero and it was pretty bizarre. Uh -huh. So I spent more time dealing with those four, those five students than I did my regular students, you know. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So yeah. beware. Right. right, right. <laughs> yeah. Well, this is very interesting. I didn't really know, appreciate too much about open education sources. This is good. Well, well, yeah, and, and and one benefit, of course, too, is I'm always trying to figure out how do I how do I keep all my texts free, you know, so so that there is no expense for the student in taking the classes unless wow. you know it's a text that I that I highly value that think is going to have an impact on their career. Wow, that's great. Mine are pretty pricey. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Hmm. Thank you, Jennifer, so much. As you can yeah. see, we could keep going and going. There's a lot of enthusiasm yeah, for this right. topic. So thank you so much for sharing your knowledge with us today.